So thank you very much, uh, Sante Sana, uh, Karibu Haberi, which in uh, Swahili I uh, I hope is uh, is greetings and uh, and thank you. Uh, since I started working in uh, in Kenya, it's been important for me to be able to connect with our partners on the ground in um, in Key Swahili. But I have to say I've had somewhat limited success in my Swahili efforts, and uh, and I have been known to take a relatively straightforward phrase like, hello, I'm in hotel room 19, and mangle that into, hello, I have 19 vaginas. <laughs> so, uh, so I'm fairly confident that uh, that what I've just shared is uh, is greetings in, in Swahili, but, um, but that's all the Swahili I'm going to be uh, indulging in today. Uh, but I would like to start by saying a huge thank you to the consortium for inviting me here to, uh, to Dublin to share the story of the 160 girls with you. And it is a total honor and privilege to, to have this opportunity. So I'd just like to set up for you a little bit about um, how I'd like to share their story with you this morning. So I'd like to start uh, by, um, by showing you this video that will give you a little bit of background about the 160 girls. Then tell you Millie's story. Millie is the little girl who inspired the adoption of the 160 Girls Project. Then tell you who the 160 girls are, um, the justice that they were looking for in terms, of, um, in terms of their experience with sexual violence. Tell you how the, the equality effect got involved in this work. And then tell you about the landmark litigation that, uh, that we launched on their behalf. And then finally, give you an update. I just arrived from Nairobi uh, the day before yesterday in Dublin, spending a couple of weeks uh, rolling out the, the implementation of the landmark decision on the ground. So I can, I can tell you hot off the press uh, what's, uh, what's happening in Kenya now. So, um, so maybe if, if I can, can show, show, the, yeah, show the video. It's about three and a half minutes long, so you can pace yourselves. So just starting into the, uh, the story of the 160 girls, I feel like I should warn you that the story of the 160 girls often sounds like a story of violence and oppression, and it is a story of violence and oppression. But ultimately, it's a story of transformation and empowerment. So if you stick with me, I'll get you through the violence and oppression, and we'll get to the transformation and empowerment. So I wanted to start by telling you Millie's story. Millie is a little girl who was about 12 years old when she was defiled by a, um, by a man in her community. Defilement is the term that's used in the Sexual Offenses Act in Kenya to describe the rape of girls under the age of 17 years old. It's an old uh, British term that uh, is part of the excellent legal legacy inherited by, um, by the Kenyans and Canadians in, um, in their law. And uh, it doesn't exist in Canada anymore, but in Kenya it still exists. And it gives you some insight into the, um, the value placed on girls through the law that this term that is traditionally applied to property is applied to, to girls. So, so Mili had been defiled. She had received care and treatment at the Tumaini uh, Hope Rape Rescue Center in, in Meru, Kenya, where the equality effect is, is partnered. So she had been rescued by, uh, by Mercy Chitty, who is the founder and director of the Tumaini Center. Mercy is, um, Mercy is a social worker. She's not a lawyer. But she is a bit like the Erin Brockovich of Kenya. She is fearless and tireless in her efforts to, to get justice for the girls and to ensure the girls are safe. She's also tall and statuesque and gorgeous and has long red nails and, uh, and is really a, um, a force of nature. So Mercy had rescued uh, Millie, Mercy and, and the, the social workers at Tumaini. And Mercy was back in Millie's community with her following up uh, after the, the care she'd received at the center. So Millie had conceived a baby out of the rape and, uh, and she was, was at home with the baby. And Mercy and Millie went to a community meeting in, in Millie's village. And the community meeting is wrapping up and, uh, and the chief asks if anybody has anything they want to add. And Millie puts up her hand and Mercy didn't know this was coming. And the chief gives Millie permission to speak. And Millie stands and she's holding her baby. And she says, I have this baby. And she says, I never wanted this baby and I don't want this baby. And she said, because of this baby, I'm not free to go to school. And she said, I'm not free to walk the streets because that man over there, and she points to a man standing at the side of the room at this community meeting, 
She says, he raped me, and he is free, and I am not. And I want to know what you're going to do about it. And Mercy said there was this sort of collective gasp in the room as the oxygen was sucked out. And nobody had an answer for Millie. And she said some of the community members started to cry, and others hung their heads in shame, and, and nobody had an answer. And so Mercy came to the equality effect and told us the story. And she said it occurred to her at that moment that she didn't want to keep rescuing the girls, that she was done with rescuing the girls from rape, and that what she wanted was a legal advocacy solution to the very, very simple problem that she needed existing laws that are excellent in Kenya. There's a Sexual Offenses Act and a constitution that ensure that girls should be protected from rape. She just wanted those laws enforced. And the way she described it to me was that she wanted to stop mopping the floor and she wanted to turn off the tap. So she wanted a systemic equality solution to a problem of discrimination that was really at the root source of these girls' disadvantage. So the equality effect said yes, because you can't say no to, to a request like this. We were already working in Kenya on other projects. And what the equality effect does is we work to make girls' and women's rights real. So these rights exist on paper, but translating them into actual real rights that make a concrete difference in girls' lives is a challenge. But that's what we do. We develop creative and unique advocacy solutions to bring the law to life for girls and women. So the 160 girls were the girls that uh, were originally part of the, the initiative when we adopted the project. So when I was talking to Mercy about the, about the work we need to do, I said we need plaintiffs or petitioners, applicants. And she said, I have 160 girls who've been through the center that need access to justice. So in that moment, the 160 girls were born. Very sadly, since that time, some of the girls have died as a result of the trauma they've experienced. Some of them, our youngest when we started was three years old. This past summer, our, our youngest team member to, to join the initiative was admitted into the center. She's one and a half years old. And <laughs> girls as young as three months are raped in Kenya. So very sadly, some of them have died from the trauma or from the HIV AIDS they've contracted. And then on the other end of the experience, the number has increased because of the prevalence of the, of the experience. So by the time we filed the claim, we were over 240. The girls are all from an area of, of Kenya, which is about four, well, they always tell me it's about four hours outside of Nairobi. It's never taken me four hours to get there. It takes about six or seven hours to get there from, uh, from Nairobi. It's a spectacular setting at the foot of Mount Kenya. And the girls are primarily from rural families. Uh, they've been raped, as is a similar experience around the world, by people they know, by parents, grandparents, teachers, uh, by police. So the Equality Effect put together the, the legal advocacy strategy for the, for the claim. We, um, we usually start with the Canadian experience. We have a, a similar constitution and a similar legal legacy to, uh, to Kenya's. And, uh, and we used precedents that had met with some success in Canada as our reference and explored the transferability of that jurisprudence to the Kenyan context. So we considered civil claims, criminal claims, constitutional claims, and ultimately decided upon filing a constitutional claim under the new Kenyan constitution, which is an excellent constitution. And it was the first equality claim to be brought under the Kenyan Constitution, so there was an additional onus on us to make sure we got it right. So we spent two years collecting the evidence in support of the case. We wanted to make sure there were no loopholes available for the, the state to escape liability. The evidence that we collected over those two years was astounding in terms of the police failure to enforce these existing laws intended to protect girls from rape. So the evidence spanned a spectrum of experiences from very straightforward incidences of the police simply failing to refuse, uh, failing to accept a, a complaint of defilement, girls going in to report their defilement at the station, and the police just saying, no, I'm not going to take the, the complaint, refusing to write it in the occurrence book. So, um, 
so you'd get that kind of experience, which I'd saw, I'd, I've seen that happen in front of me, which to the credit of the Kenyan police, they weren't faking it while, you know, while I was there. They were you know, discriminating baldly and, uh, in, boldly in front, of these, in front of me with these girls. And then uh, you'd have the police saying, no, no, you know, um, you're, very, uh, you're very attractive, you're a very pretty little girl, you must have invited it, and surely you enjoyed it. So re-victimizing the girls through a form of harassment, um, asking for money to take the complaints, uh, claiming they didn't have any fuel to, to take a complaint, up to the extreme of the police raping the girls again. So it, uh, it was a full, full spectrum of evidence. It was uh, 508 pages of evidence that we eventually filed with the court. So this is where we start to shift, though, from, from the violence and oppression to the transformation and empowerment. So on October 11th, 2012, the first International Day of the Girl Child, we filed the 160 Girls Claim in the High Court of Kenya. And the day before the claim was filed, we met with the, the girls and, and their, their parents and their advocates. Many of the girls are abandoned once they're raped, but, um, but the, the parents that stick with the girls are absolute heroes. They are so dedicated to their, their girls. And so we met with them and explained that, um, based on the Canadian experience, we would not uh, be inviting the girls to have a public role in the filing, that, uh, that we would want to protect their identities and, and ensure their anonymity and the way that the, the litigation was built. It was, um, it was designed so that uh, it was only the social worker's evidence that was put before the court. It was not the evidence of the girls themselves, so there'd be no risk of re-victimization through, um, through cross-examination. So, um, so we, the, we had organized a march to, to sort of celebrate the filing of the claim, marching from the um, center of town in Meru to the courthouse. And we, um, we explained that we advised, this is what the Equality Effect does, we advise and, and provide guidance, but it's ultimately it's our, our grassroots partners' decisions that get implemented all the time. So we said we advise that the girls and their guardians not participate in this to ensure their, their anonymity and security. So they all smiled and nodded politely. And then the next day we're at the march and uh, getting things organized, getting started, and this bus rolls up and all the girls start rolling off the bus and they've got these signs that say, Girls' Rights are Human Rights, you know, International Day of the Girl Child. And they came running up to me and they said, you know, Fiona, this is our day. These are our rights, this is our case, this is our day. And we have to march. And I thought, you know, like, they're right. Like, this, you know, this is their day. And besides, there's more of them than there were of me. So, uh, so they, they had to march. So, so they marched and, uh, and they sang emancipation songs and we sang freedom songs and we, we got to the courthouse. And the courthouse knew this was happening. They knew that uh, Mercy had, um, had advised them and got permission for us to, to come and file the complaint in this public way. And we got there, and one of the girls who was uh, one of the lead complainants in the, in the case, Esther, she was at the front of the pack, and, uh, and we got to the courthouse gates, and Esther started chanting, Yakimungo, Yakimungo, which is, um, I demand my rights. And the rest of the girls started joining in, and the constituent members, constituency members started joining in. And the police inside the courthouse grounds, you could see the look of panic on their faces. And they didn't like this. They didn't know what was going on. And they ran down to the courthouse gates and literally slammed the gates shut in the faces of the girls. And it was this really strong personification in terms of access of denial of justice when those gates slammed shut in the girls' faces. And the girls at first were a bit startled and taken aback, and, and then they started to laugh because I think the tables had turned, and in that moment, they knew what power felt like. So it was this fantastic moment and uh, sort of goosebumps for, for everyone. And then Mercy, uh, being the uh, you know, effective uh, change maker that she is, she negotiated, we got in, we filed the complaint. And then that night, we're back at the shelter, and we're singing and dancing. And as is the way in Kenya, you have to, uh, you have to celebrate and eat. And so we had this big party. And then ever, after everybody left, Esther turned to me. And she's, we were talking about the day. And she said, you know, when we started this project, we'd, we'd had an art project that the girls were involved in. And she said, um, when we were asked for our justice words as part of that art project, she said, I didn't know what justice was. She said, I didn't know what equality was. I didn't know what any of it was. And she said, today I know 
And she said, today is the best day of my life. And I thought, you know, in that moment, we have won. Whatever else happens, we've won. And then I had to tell her that it's not like this every day. It's not like we're marching and, uh, and engaging with, uh, with justice like this every day. But I want to show you a, a sh another short video. It's, um, it's about three and a half minutes long about the filing day, about the story that I just told you, just to, um, uh, to sort of bring the, the stories to life a bit for you. So on October 12th, October 11th, 2012, we filed the 160 year olds claim, and eight months later, on May 27th, 2013, the High Court of Kenya released its decision, and the 160 girls won. They got justice. So it was a huge landmark day for the 160 girls, but also for all 10 million girls of Kenya and for girls internationally. So the court decided that the police treatment of the girls' defilement claims did indeed violate their human rights under the Constitution, under regional human rights law and international human rights law. And we had made quite a radical argument after much debate amongst the legal team that the police were responsible not just for the harms that had resulted from their treatment of the girls, but also were responsible for the climate of impunity that allowed for the rapes in the first place. And the court agreed with us. So in this decision, the 160 girls and the Kenyan High Court set the high water mark for girls' rights internationally. So it was a huge victory, and, uh, and we celebrated this victory. But then we had to figure out how to make it real. And this has traditionally been the experience in Canada that women and girls will litigate equality claims. We've got some victories, but then the lawyers walk away. And in this instance, our partners made a very specific request for the Equality Effect to stay involved and to help actually implement the 160 girls decision and ensure that it was made real. So we have spent the last uh, eight to 10 months figuring out an implementation plan that will, uh, will ensure that the decision is actualized. So we had an unusual situation develop where the Kenyan police contacted the Equality Effect and have asked us to help them implement the decision. And the courts said in the decision that the police must investigate defilement claims in a prompt, effective, proper, and professional way. And to the credit of the Kenyan police, it's not really clear what that means. I mean, it's, you know, you get a good sense of what the expectation is, but the specifics aren't spelled out. So the Kenyan police asked the Equality Effect to assist them to make sure that they comply. And we were happy to do that in a cautiously optimistic way, thinking that this is, this is progress. So we are now partnered with the Kenya National Human Rights Commission, who we were partnered with on the litigation, and with the Kenya National Police Service to ensure the decision is implemented. We're providing training. The training that the police have asked for is not just like a one-day, half-day session where you know they can check off a box. They've specifically asked for a year's worth of training. We're piloting with four districts, four of the 47 districts in Kenya, to roll out the training in a pilot-type project. We, uh, we did the first round of the training during the last two weeks that I was, I was in Kenya. And one of the uh, members of the media there asked me if I thought this was real, if I thought the, the commitment of the Kenyan police was real, and if maybe they were faking it. And I have to say, it would be a lot of work to be faking it to, uh, to put together this huge training initiative that, uh, that we are working on. And the senior police that we're working with, the 11 members of the, of the senior police that are part of the, the 160 girls team now, their commitment and dedication is tangible. They are pushing for this to move forward in a way that is, uh, I have to say, surprising and very inspiring. So we are, we are moving forward on a systemic level with this training. We've developed something that is the first of its kind internationally that we hope will help the police in terms of ensuring access to justice. We're developing a um, 160 girls phone app. So this phone application will provide a step-by-step -step in terms of how to actually implement the, uh, the decision. We're also working with communities and ensuring that, uh, that they have the information and education about the 160 girls decision so they know how to enforce their rights once they get to the police, and doing a big public awareness and, uh, and public education campaign using the media. 
So it's a little bit like the drunk driving campaigns that we've seen work in the past, bringing together communities and the law and police to work collectively to achieve change. So it is an ambitious undertaking. We, just in closing, I'll tell you where things are at with the 160 girls themselves. We've seen justice secured in 80% of the girls' cases. So the police are following up and we're having some success. About four weeks ago, a little girl named Yvonne, her case uh, had, um, had uh, been, um, uh, the police had refused to investigate. Initially, she was raped on the way to collect water from a local river. And then following the release of the 160 girls decision, the police did follow up, they investigated, they made an arrest, and four weeks ago we got a conviction and a life sentence for the perpetrator. So that is the kind of success we're seeing. Mercy's not complaining, but she does say that the police are in her office so often now and so much looking for, for support and guidance and ideas about how to investigate these cases that it's hard for her to do the job she's supposed to be doing. So, so that is progress. And today, actually, as we speak in Maua, Meru, Kenya, Esther's case, Esther is the little girl who was at the head of the, uh, the demonstration pack, Esther was raped by a police officer. She became pregnant as a result of the rape. Not uh, surprisingly, the police refused to investigate. Following the 160 girls' decision, the police have investigated, made an arrest, and we have the third hearing date in that, uh, in that trial happening right now as we speak. So we are cautiously optimistic that, uh, that, all, of this, uh, that all of this change is real. And we will continue to work with a two-year rollout on these, uh, on these pilot initiatives. And I invite you to please stay in touch with us to find out uh, how the story evolves. So there are postcards on the administration table with the Equality Effect address, website address. Um, please sign up on Facebook and for our newsletters. And, uh, and we'd really like to keep you informed about the story as it progresses. So uh, thank you so much for your attention. And again, for the invitation, Asante Sanatana.